Congregation, I invite you now to turn in your copies of God's Word to Luke, Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, we'll be looking at the first five verses of this chapter this morning. Luke chapter 6. As we come to this passage, I want to remind you, or well, maybe I didn't mention it yet. Uh, we have three pas- passages in a row where Jesus and his disciples will do something and the Pharisees are there to find fault. And yet in all of these, each of these three, Jesus responds in a way that reveals his majesty and the magnitude of who he is and what he has come to do. Now, last week we looked at the first, and that was where Jesus and his disciples were eating and drinking with tax collectors. And this morning we come to the the second, the middle of these three instances. And uh, these last two both have to do with the Sabbath. And so here now as I read Luke chapter 6, I'll be reading the first five verses And this is the word of our God. Let us hear him. On a Sabbath, while he, that is Jesus, was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those with him? And he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we praise you that uh, you are enthroned on high, and Lord, that you have given us your word, and Lord, we pray uh, for your servant, Lord, that I would speak uh, faithfully, Lord, that I would speak boldly your truth, Uh, Lord, that we would hear, Lord, that we would be not as those that uh, have ears as as strainers, as those that uh, will, will just miss everything, but Lord, that you would give us ears to hear, and hearts to believe, and hands and feet ready, and able, and Lord, that you would grant obedience to your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever been hounded by someone who is looking to find fault? It can be wearying if you have. It can be exhausting. It can leave you longing for rest. A friend, if you've had that experience, and I I really hope not all of you have, but if you have, I want you to know that our Lord Jesus experienced the same thing. Jesus experienced those who were looking to find fault, looking to trap him. And he also is the one who promises rest. And so I I invite all of you uh, this morning... uh, whether you've had that experience or not, come to the Lord Jesus for rest. Come to the Lord Jesus for rest. As we come to this passage and the next, there are several things that distance us from its events. And largely, we're, we're, we're culturally removed, I think, uh, uh, at least as far as you know, the broader culture here in America or even, even evangelical and Christian uh, uh, culture uh, is, is largely removed from the idea of the Sabbath. And so uh, for the sake of this week and next week's sermon, I'd like to start by, by helping us to understand a bit of the intensity of what Jesus was being accused of. Uh, let's ask and answer the question, why make a big deal of the Sabbath? Uh, In America today, Sabbath observance is almost unheard of. Uh, Some of you uh, may uh, have heard of blue laws, uh, blue laws which restricted activities such as purchase of alcohol on Sundays. Uh, Those are largely viewed as a relic of the past. Uh, Even among Reformed denominations, many have shied away from teaching on the Sabbath. And so this is something that many uh, are ignorant of. And so uh, we need to do a bit of work at getting uh, at the beginning of this sermon, and uh, again, I'm introducing something for for next week's sermon as well, to understand why the Sabbath was such a big deal. And and I want you to see that this is not just something that the Pharisees make a big deal of. I want you to see how this is something that mattered to God. 
Now, the first thing that I want to point, point out to you is that the Sabbath is a creation ordinance. That is, that God himself, when he made all things that exist, he labored, he, he created uh, for six days, and then the scriptures tell us, Genesis chapter 2, that he rested on the seventh day. And so think of all the things that God did foundationally for all of creation in that, in that first creation week. Uh, that means that uh, this Sabbath or, uh, an ordinance, this, this ordaining of the Sabbath is right up there with the, the other things that God made, including uh, making mankind in God's image. Uh, making uh, marriage, making gender, making labor, uh, all these things which continue to have significance. Uh, uh, we see that the Sabbath is right there uh, with them. And see also that this arose from God's own example. God created all things in six days and rested the seventh. And so Adam, made in God's image, uh, knew that the way that, it, the way that he was to practice being human was to look not at the creatures that were below him, but to look to God who had created him and set this pattern. Now, of course, God himself didn't need to rest, uh, but he did so so that Adam, a, a creature, would know how he is supposed to uh, f- function. And thus the Sabbath, uh, Jesus uh, says elsewhere in parallel passages to the one we're looking at this morning, the Sabbath was made for man. It's made for all mankind, Adam and all of his uh, descendants. Uh, God not only set this pattern by his action, but by his word. Uh, We also see that God didn't just uh, do something, but he he said something. God speaks about uh, the Sabbath. Uh, We see that uh, in the Ten Commandments. Uh, So that is, even though the practices regarding the Sabbath, many of them began before the Ten Commandments were given, it was written down among the Ten Commandments. And the timing was significant. Uh, God God not only created us, but he saved his people. He he gave salvation. Do you remember uh, earlier in the service I mentioned the the old song of creation versus the new song of salvation? Uh, Similarly, uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, as they're found in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy chapter 5, uh, they they have this, this, this difference in emphasis regarding this commandment. In Exodus chapter 20, it's given because God created, God rested. That was his pattern that he set. But in Deuteronomy 5, it's because he saved you, because God brought a people out of bondage, where they, were, they had taskmasters over their, them, where they had burdens laid upon them. Uh, this was a, a command to, to not only give them rest, but to show them how to give rest to others. Uh, he gave them among the, those Ten Commandments. So, so, so thinking how uh, among those creation ordinances, uh, so, so there was the Sabbath, so among the Ten Commandments. And we can think of uh, how God commanded there to be no other gods, so that we do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal. In the midst of those commands, he also gave this commandment. And it is part, then, of his moral law. And this, this then, makes it gravely important to the story before us. If, if Jesus broke the moral law, if he broke God's commandments in any way, then Jesus was not righteous. We, you and I, would have no Savior if Jesus broke uh, one of the Ten Commandments. Of course, then, then lest you think of the, the Sabbath only as a command, only as a, as a burden, a requirement, uh, uh, we should also see that uh, uh, just doing this survey of, 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 of the, the Sabbath, uh, God also spoke of the Sabbath as a blessing. This is often hidden from us. Uh, sometimes some of us come out of a, 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 a history where uh, maybe we had a very strict uh, way that the Sabbath was kept in our, in our own homes or, 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 or we have a perception of how, uh, how that could be such a burden. Uh, we sometimes need to be reminded that it really, really was about rest. <laughs> it really was uh, not about our performance. It was about uh, God saying, no, set, set aside your labors. Uh, uh, this is about grace. And God himself uh, says, uh, uses that kind of language regarding it. For instance, in Exodus 31, 13, where he says, it is a sign that I, the Lord, sanctify you. The Sabbath is not uh, something that we keep in order to show how great we are, um, but it's rather something uh, that God himself uh, Uh, gives to his people and and shows that he is the one who makes them holy he himself is their is their he is their sanctifier Uh, and as i mentioned uh, in relation to the the people of god coming out of slavery this was also a way that god blessed the poor Uh, this was a a a blessing that god gave not just to you but to your manservant to your maidservant Uh, god gave even an ox uh, he even gave the animals a day of rest and so this was a blessing that he he was giving that was a good thing and such that uh, he says in Isaiah chapter 58 that his people should call the Sabbath a delight. Uh, now, again, the way that you hear people talk about Sabbath keeping or, or anything like that, uh, often 
the light is like the farthest thing <laughs> from, from the conversation. And yet uh, God promised great blessing to those who kept the Sabbath. Uh, one that I mentioned during the, the call to worship. Uh, other uh, promise that is that he would make his people ride on the heights of the earth. Uh, to the eunuchs who kept the Sabbath, he promised a house and a name better than sons and daughters. And yet with great promises do come great responsibility. God uh, guarded uh, this uh, in such a way that is surprising to us. Uh, when people broke his Sabbath, uh, there are instances where God e either commanded or, or, or directly, uh, directly spoke uh, that, that they, they, such a, a Sabbath breaker was to be put to death. Um, uh, uh, he also said if his people did not keep his Sabbaths, he would cast them out of land. And that, and that was not an empty promise, but something he actually did. 2 Corinthians 36, he, he cast them out. That's why the exile was 70 years, so the land could make up for its missed Sabbaths. Now, friends, uh, all this to say that God made a big deal of the Sabbath. God, who does not change, who does not overreact, but gives judgments that are perfectly aligned with his holiness, commanded that violation of the Sabbath was a crime worthy of death, which has everything to do with the passage before us. The Pharisees in this passage are not just entertaining them with obscure theological uh, puzzles. They're talking about what, if the Old Testament civil law were enforced, would send Jesus' disciples, and like, likely Jesus, who's there with them, condoning, defending them, it would send them to the grave, send Jesus to the cross early. Or think, if Jesus really did break this law, if he broke the Sabbath, as I've said already, uh, he, should, he should die and suffer God's wrath for breaking God's Sabbath. He could not then die for our sins if he had sins of his own to die for. Friends, all that to give us maybe a bit of perspective as to why the question in this passage is so important. Uh, with that framework, let's now ask, one, what were they asking uh, when they said, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And that will give us the right framework to understand Jesus' answer. Now first, if they say, what it, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? Uh, we may wonder exactly what they're saying is unlawful. We, let's ask what law was broken. Again, our cultural distance from these disciples uh, and, and Jesus and, and the time of the Pharisees may make us wonder at several things that are described here, whether they were lawful or not. Uh, the Pharisees don't specify what activity they find fault with, and so we need to pay attention to the context that Luke is providing. That, that helps us, I think, to understand uh, what, what it is particularly they were, asked, they were finding fault with. Luke describes a situation the disciples are going through the grain fields, uh, and as they're going, uh, they picked up some heads of grain, they rubbed them in their hands, and you might think, why would you do that? Well, if you, if you know about grain, you know that it grows with a chaff on it, and so uh, that rubbing is not just, you know, they, they needed something to do with their hands, this isn't a fidget spinner or something, they're actually removing, with that rubbing, the chaff, and they might, you know, blow, blow the, the chaff away, and then they might have, you know, you have the, have the grain right there, and you pop it in your mouth, you got a snack, okay? You've got something to eat. This is the situation that the Pharisees find fault with. Now, I, even so, you, there might be multiple questions of, that we might ask uh, of, of what, what really is the problem here. You, 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 you know, one question people, modern people might ask is, are they trespassing? It says they're going through the grain fields. You know, we, we're living in a time since the enclosure movement where there are all these fences and gates that, that protect fields. You don't go through them. That's going to prevent the harvest from being as good as it should be. Um, uh, furthermore, they're going through and they are, they are picking heads of grain, does that mean that they were stealing? Were they breaking the commandment, you shall not steal? Uh, a farmer today would suffer loss if you went into his cornfield, you brought a basket with you, you start taking corn cobs, that's, that's theft. We know that that's wrong. So is the, are those some of the things that are wrong here? Well, interestingly, God's law actually had a provision for exactly what the disciples were doing here. And it's found in Deuteronomy 23, 25. Deuteronomy 23, 25. God said this, if you go into your neighbor's standing grain, so that, that means it's not harvested yet, it's still, still growing, it's still out there in the field, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. Okay, you, you, 
get what God's commanding here? He's saying, if, if you do, you know, if you're walking through the grain fields and you take it in your hand and you eat some, that's okay. God said so in his law. Um, and, and why would God command that, by the way? Uh, again, God shows us how to love our neighbor as ourselves. Uh, if, if we were hungry and we, were, we happened to be far from our own property, far from our own food, we, we, would, we, would, we would want someone to show hospitality to us. Or if we were poor, we'd want to have some way that we could provide for ourselves. And so God permitted gleaning. God permitted uh, even this as, as an expectation of hospitality. God commanded it in his law. This was, this was what, you, what should be expected, is that you can take a handful of grain. That's fine. Um, uh, Similarly, you know, if, if you're at a, you know, say a restaurant and you see there at the, the hostess's table, you see a large bowl full of jelly beans, it's expected that you can take a few jelly beans and you can eat them. You, you maybe even take enough to eat, be, eat, still be eating them on the way to the car. That's expected. That's okay. But it would be quite a different thing, wouldn't it, if you took that bowl of jelly beans and you grabbed your wife's purse and put them in there and then you walked out right there. There's something different. And that's what God himself is making as a distinction in Deuteronomy 23, 25. You can go, you can eat the plucks, you can eat the, the, you can pluck ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. So don't, don't go in and start harvesting. Don't go in there and start stealing because that, 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 that would be crossing a line. All that to say that God in his law said that what the disciples did was legal not just according to social custom, but according to God's own law. It wasn't trespassing, it wasn't stealing, and it wasn't harvesting, uh, we, we might say. It was, uh, uh, it was as the Pharisees put it, but, they, but the Pharisees see this as they're doing something that is not lawful on the Sabbath. Uh, Although uh, there, are, there are a few specific examples that God does give of Sabbath breaking, um, picking up sticks on the Sabbath, gathering manna. For the most part, God gives general principles regarding the Sabbath. Uh, do not work, do not do your own pleasure on the Sabbath. And so if we were trying to find a Bible passage closest to what the Pharisees had in mind, uh, as described as doing, uh, I you're kind of at a, at a grasping at straws. What, what exactly passage did they think? And maybe, uh, maybe it was Exodus 34, 21. So maybe what, what the disciples are doing wrong here is that they're breaking this command, the, the command that says, six days you shall work, but on the seventh you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest, you shall rest. Ah, aha, there you go. The Pharisees are, are suddenly on the case. The disciples are plucking heads of grain. Well, that's harvesting. Didn't you know? If you pluck a head of grain, that's harvesting. And, and they're rubbing it in their hands. Oh, th th that's threshing. You can't do that in time of harvest. You see how flimsy their accusations are. Their accusations are, are they're saying you're doing what's not lawful. But what law are they breaking? Friends, it's not God's law, but is in fact their tradition. And this is where we should see that there is a clear distinction between what God had commanded regarding the Sabbath and the Pharisees' own tradition. Did God forbid a poor man from gleaning a handful of grain to nourish himself on the Sabbath? No. But when the people of Israel came back from exile, knowing that they were set there because, at least in part of their Sabbath breaking, they doubled down on writing their own lists of do's and don'ts for the Sabbath. And they had, by this time, by the time of the Pharisees, they had come up with such an extensive list that a rabbi described it as a mountain suspended by a thread. That is, there's very little scripture to go on defining the Sabbath. There's a lot of laws that they had come up with. And so the Mishnah, which is a second century writing down of some of these laws that would have been passed around, these oral laws, record uh, that one, pharaoh, one rabbi at least said, he is culpable of Sabbath breaking who takes ears of grain equal to a lamb's full's mouthful. Did I say that right? You've broken the Sabbath if you take enough grain that would be more than a lamb could fit in its mouth. So you know, maybe, maybe they're going to the disciples and they're, they're, they're saying, oh, I've got a lamb's mouth about this. Ah, you're a breaker right there. Okay, what is that? It's an addition to God's law. It's a specification beyond what God himself specified. And, I, and we learn here that we need to be quite careful about our own uh, Sabbath lists, our own ways, of, ways that we think about keeping all of God's laws. Uh, we, we sometimes call it keeping a hedge. We can sometimes add to it, and we think, I'll be safer if I keep a little bit further away from God's law. 
But the problem is you're getting away from God's law. You're not letting what he, stead, he, what he said stand. Friends, it is a lot easier to have lists of do's and don'ts, lists of rules uh, to come, uh, uh, to, to focus on that and to not even rest on this day of rest. Now, this is important, again, because if Jesus did break God's law, not just man's tradition, but if he broke God's law, he would be a lawbreaker, a sinner. He could not save us from sins. But the Pharisees found fault with Jesus, rather Jesus' disciples, Jesus with them, on the basis of their own law. So the Pharisees had an addition to God's holy law. They had their own oral tradition. They had their own oral law. And it was these additions to God's law that Jesus elsewhere speaks against. Uh, For instance, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you have heard it said. That's an oral tradition. But I say to you, Jesus reaffirmed God's commands. In, In Matthew 15, Jesus will say that for the sake of their tradition, they make void the word of God. Now, the Pharisees saw it quite differently, didn't they? They saw themselves as flexing on God's law. They're, we're the real righteous people. We're the real people who, who know about keeping the Sabbath. But friends, if you add to God's law, inevitably, you will take away from it. God doesn't need your help regarding his commands. He has said what he has said. And we need to hear him. And we need to heed him. Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. And so what what does Jesus need to do? He needs to rebuke these Pharisees, because they are liars. They are pretending that that the, the, the law that was broken was God's law, when it's in fact their own traditions that they had developed. Friends, why are they doing that? Well, they're doing that uh, because it props them up, but the the result is they end up painting Jesus as if he were a sinner. That's the worst part of it, is that they're they're doing this to reject Jesus, the Savior of mankind. And so Jesus corrects them. Jesus rebukes them. Uh, Matthew gives a bit more detail, but we'll stick with what Luke has here. Uh, First, Jesus is greater than David. Now notice the method that Jesus uses. Uh, they need correction, and what does he refer them to? He says, have you never read? He goes back to the scriptures. When Jesus was tempted by Satan, he went to the scriptures. When Jesus is accused by the Pharisees, he goes to the scriptures. The, the scripture corrects errors and man-made tradition. And so, so somebody comes to you and says, we have this very ancient thing, and if you want to be a really holy person, if you want to be a good Christian, you need to make sure you, you keep this tradition because it's, it's a good tradition. You, you need to know, is it, is it biblical? Is it what God has said? Because that's where Jesus goes to show the error that they have here. Scripture is the word of God, and it cannot err, and it does not change. And this means that the Pharisees who, provi- who prided themselves for knowing God's will should have known better. Jesus says, have you never read? It's expected that you should know this already. And, and know this from what? And Jesus actually goes to the passage I read earlier in this worship service. That passage where David with his disciples uh, well, rather, is he going on behalf of his disciples? They're, 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 they're hiding. Uh, uh, he goes uh, to, the, the, to the tabernacle. He goes to the place of God, and he asks for bread. And he's offered and given the show bread. He's given the holy bread that was, that was set into God's presence. And was, when it, it was supposed to be there for a week, and then when it's taken down, it's supposed to be only eaten by the priests. That's given to David. Now, it's not immediately clear why Jesus would bring up this example although there are plenty of uh, potential connections. Uh, One, I I think this would help us a a bit of context here, the showbread, or bread of the presence, it it is usually changed on the Sabbath. And so that would be maybe a connection. Why does he bring this up? This is that, you know, David's passage doesn't have anything to do with the Sabbath. Well, it would have to do with the Sabbath uh, because it says that the the, the bread of the presence is being taken down. And so that, that change would usually happen on the Sabbath, even though it's not explicitly mentioned in that passage. And so David's entering and receiving bread on the Sabbath. If so, uh, that would have been apparent to the Pharisees uh, if if they knew that uh, connection. Uh, Furthermore, David and those with him were hungry, just like Jesus and his disciples 
they're hungry, and so they, they eat a snack. They, they, they need nourishment, and so they, they eat what, what is provided them. And in both pas- that passage and Jesus' passage, there's a priority uh, shown between God's laws. That is, even though in Leviticus 24, 9, it says, and it, the showbread, uh, shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place, since it is for him a most holy portion out of the Lord's food offerings, a perpetual due. Even though God had said this is just for the priests, David is in need. And there's a, a, a priority for feeding someone who is needy. Uh, even though there is a, a recognition given even in that passage, are your men holy? That is to say that God's ceremonial law was never intended to deprive God's anointed king of his needs. And that's maybe the third and, and, and chief connection here, is that the Pharisees would see themselves as, we're the ones who are pro-David. David was the first king of the dynasty that we're still allegiant to. We, we, we really don't like those Romans. And by the way, we don't like you, Jesus. But we, we, we're on David's side, whereas Jesus is saying, no, you're not. You're against David because you're against David's son. If David had a right to go in there, as the anointed king, and God would preserve David's life in this way that was surprising, so there should be no surprise that Jesus would be provided for because Jesus is the greater one than David. Jesus is the one that David pointed forward to. Now, they may not have gotten all that, so Jesus had to tell them. And then Jesus went beyond that. He told them this, he reveals something about himself, and and he highlights this connection, which I think is so important for us, and that is that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. He says it this way, he says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Um, Son of Man, a lot of people think that as being just a reference to Jesus as a man or any man, but this is actually a reference to that mighty one of Daniel 6. Uh, this is also Jesus saying that I am the son of Adam. He, he came to be that perfect human, that, that one who perfectly shows forth God's image. Uh, he shows mankind what it's meant to be human. And he then, of all people, knows how to rest. We have to confess, we don't really know how to rest very well, do we? Neither do we know how to work. There's a lot of ways we, we, we mess this up. If we are going to understand what that Sabbath was ever about, we need to look to the Son of Man. We need to look, look to that perfect one who kept this, but also, Jesus says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And that is Jesus saying that he is the Lord. Jesus is the Son. He is God. He is really and truly God, as, as, as much God as the, the Father is God and the Spirit is God. He is Lord, and that's, that's reference to God himself, God's personal name. That same God who made all things in six days and rested and in whose image we were made, Jesus is that Lord. That is that same Lord who gave his law on Mount Sinai. Jesus is that Lord. That say that the Son was with the Father and the Spirit when the Sabbath law was given to Moses. It's his law. And so, friends, imagine with me a man who's in court. And his defense is a peculiar interpretation of the law. He, and it, maybe he even recognized that. This is maybe not the way that people have traditionally understood this law, but, but I think I've got a case to be made that it could be understood this way. And so he, he gives his defense. And, uh, and imagine that the, the judge looking at him through this whole thing, and then finally the judge opens his mouth and gives a guilty verdict and says this. You are a fool. You know nothing of the law. You said that the law meant so and so, but that's that's in your brain. That's not in the law itself. And I should know because before becoming your judge, I was a legislator. I wrote this law. And you're telling me that I don't understand it so that you can defend yourself. Friends, Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the legislator because he's the Lord. To paraphrase the fourth commandment, Jesus could say, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as I, Jesus, the Lord Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath. To me, Jesus, your God, I rested on this day. I brought you out of slavery. Again, noting the Exodus 20, the Deuteronomy 5 differences to that command. That is to say that if we want to know what the Sabbath is about, we need to go to Jesus. If we know ourselves to be broken people that don't know how to work and we don't know how to rest, we need to come to Jesus. And that's what he himself says. 
He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so friends, that's maybe as far as we'll get. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Take that away this week. Think on that. If you want to know about work, if you want to know about rest, you need to look to Jesus. And we'll come back next week and we'll see more about this Jesus, uh, this Jesus who is the Son of Man, who is Lord of the Sabbath. Come to him for rest. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we, we recognize that there, there's, there's so much history, there's so much of your word that we are ignorant of. And Lord, we are at fault uh, for not seeking these things out, for not uh, knowing your mind, knowing what you care about, and making those things that you care about things that are precious to us. And Lord, often we are like the Pharisees. We are so apt to come up with uh, some gentleman's uh, rule of thumb, some uh, other person's wise saying that that distances us from your revealed word. Lord, forgive us this. Lord, thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are righteous. Thank you that you came full well to show us what rest is really about. And Lord, that there is provision in you. Uh, Lord, that, that, that there, there is a, a meal for the hungry. There is uh, something that you have that we need as your disciples, and you defend your people, uh, Lord, as, as the one who is our righteousness. Uh, Lord, even the law giver is the law keeper for our sakes. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd help us to know you as this Lord, and, Lord, that we would find this rest in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.